So as I announced in my, in my introductory speech, uh, not of all the potential attendees could be present here. So we will start uh, by having uh, a video of uh, Mr. Raphael Grossi, the General Directorate of the IAEA, who shall give us views uh, on the nuclear market, the expectations from governments, and the consequences, of course, for the fuel cycle, and if you listen very carefully at the end, a real need for engineers, both male and female. It is a pleasure to be part of Global 2022, an important forum to discuss the nuclear fuel cycle, without which there can be no sustainable use of nuclear energy and its peaceful applications. If there is a key takeaway from the current energy crisis, it is this. Now, more than ever, we must be courageous and clear-eyed about what it's going to take to build the clean, robust and resilient energy systems of the future. In my conversation with leaders from around the world, it is clear that more and more countries are looking at nuclear for its minimal environmental footprint and maximum energy output to strengthen their energy security while reducing emissions and air pollution. The IEA is helping ensure nuclear energy is safe, secure and safeguarded and that decision makers, operators and regulators from all over the world have the information and assistance they really need. Almost half of the CO2 reductions towards net zero will rely on technologies that aren't yet ready for the market. Advanced nuclear energy, including reactors and fuel cycles, are no exception. To meet global climate and energy goals, we will need both large reactors and small modular ones. Almost every week, I find myself discussing SMRs with a minister or ambassador from countries as far apart as Africa and Latin America. And the IEA helps disseminate information about SMRs through events, workshops and, and online resources. While the first SMR units have been deployed in China and Russia, there are more than 70 SMR designs at different stages of development. That means that most SMR designs still need to be tested and demonstrated, and the same applies to the associated fuel cycles. This decade will be critical for the development and demonstration of advanced nuclear technologies and fuel cycles to ensure that they are ready for a timely rollout from 2030 onwards. The IEA's platform on SMRs and their applications support member states in this effort. It provides them with streamlined access to all agencies' services on SMRs, from technology development and deployment to nuclear safety, security and safeguards. We must also anticipate the possible impacts of their innovative fuel concepts on the back end of the nuclear fuel cycle. This applies to storage, transportation, reprocessing and recycling, and disposal of high-level waste. In this, the IEA assists countries through technical meetings, publications and international conferences. Recycling technologies, especially when paired with fast reactors can make important contributions to sustainability by reducing the use of natural resources and the burden on geological repositories. Our recent international conference on fast reactors and related fuel cycles brought together more than 600 participants from 27 countries and six international organizations for an in-depth discussion on many of these topics. We know there are still challenges to address if nuclear power is to achieve its full potential. Let me cite an example. 
I recently launched the Nuclear Harmonization and Standardization Initiative, NESI for short. Just last month, we had a successful kickoff meeting with top-level decision makers from the industry and the regulatory side, all under the same roof. I'm confident the unique position and global reach of the IEA and a lot of hard work will make Nessie a game changer, a real game changer. By facilitating harmonization and standardization, we will facilitate the effective and timely deployment of safe and secure SMRs and large advanced reactors. We all need to do our part to achieve a better world for us and the generations that will follow us. Getting there will require all hands on deck. That means we need more women on our teams. The IEA's Marie Sklodowska Curie Fellowship Program is about to begin its third round. Help us, help us spread the word. It is a great opportunity for women from across the globe to get financial support towards a master's degree in a nuclear subject. In conclusion, I wish you a successful conference and look forward to hearing about its outcomes. I think uh, we can hear very carefully uh, those words uh, giving a, a global overview uh, on the world current uh, situation. Uh, and the real interest uh, for our engineering community and scientific community uh, for future developments. Uh, before uh, going through the panel, where we shall have uh, first a global overview of uh, some reactor trends, uh, future developments, and an insight uh, country by country, uh, uh, I will first have the launch of a second video um, where Mr. Wang Xiaojung the current president, sorry, chairman <coughs> of the Chinese Nuclear Society, former uh, chairman of uh, CNNC, which is the largest uh, Chinese corporation covering both uh, the reactor use, but also the whole fuel cycle. And he shall give uh, what are the recent trends and what is the global situation in China. Thank you. Dujiung 2020年9月22日 经济可靠的能源，在低碳转型、保障能源安全等方面，将发挥更加重要的作用。截止2022年6月底，中国在运核电机组54台，总装机容量为5578万千瓦，位列全球第三。2021年。中国核电发电量占全国总发电量的百分之五，为减少二氧化碳、二氧化硫和碳氧化合物排放做出了积极的贡献。经过三十余年的发展，中国核电技术取得了长足进步。目前，中国已拥有华龙一号和国核一号等
，又转化，又浓缩，核燃料组件在内的完整核燃料加工产业体系，支撑了压水堆、重水堆、高温气冷堆的发展，同时积极推进。环形燃料元件和耐事故燃料元件的研发，中国坚持核燃料避世循环政策，确保铀资源充分利用，促进放射性废物最小化，首座玻璃固化工程完成热试并投入运行，高放废物地质处置地下实验室进入工程实施阶段。当前应对气候变化已成为全球最为紧迫的议题，世界各国正在加快采取务实行动，以应对日益严峻的气候变化。二零二一年十一月，近二百个国家在《联合国气候变化框架公约》第二十六次缔结方大会上共获得签署了。《格拉斯哥气候公约》就二零三零年将全球的温室气体排放减少百分之四十五达成共识，并承诺逐步减少煤炭使用，减少对化石燃料的补贴。核能是推进全球清洁转型发展、构建现代能源体系的关键驱动力。除供电外，核能还可以用于制氢、工业供热、区域供暖、海水淡化、合成燃料和化工产品生产等。随着中国双碳战略持续推进，能源安全战略的深化落实，核能将持续积极、安全、有序发展。预计在二零二一至二零二五年间，中国将进一步加快扩大装机规模。保持每年六至八台核电机组的核准开工节奏，核能发电量也将大幅增加。预计到二零三五年，中国核电在总发电量中的占比将达到百分之十左右。中国核能技术在核燃料循环技术也将继续保持较高的研发投入，促进新的技术创新。为全球核能发展做出贡献。面对未来，中国三代压水堆核电技术将持续改进优化，进一步提升安全性和经济性，形成改进的机型系列。高温气冷堆、钠冷快堆有望通过技术创新实现示范项目的推广，并拓展应用场景。周国家发挥高温气冷堆、模块化小堆、低温供热堆、海上浮动堆等各自优势，紧密结合用户、综合能源消费需要，建立集供电、供热、制氢、海水淡化等一体的多能互补、多能联供的区域综合能源系统。实现对石化、钢铁等高耗能、高碳排行业的清洁供热。核能综合利用将实现双碳目标的进程中提档加速。此外，熔岩堆等先进核能技术的基础科研工作将一进一步夯实，逐步由概念走向科研示范。聚变技术将。持续取得新的突破，天然铀勘察采冶技术、纯化转化技术将向绿色、低碳、智能、高效方向发展。新型核燃料元件的安全性、高效性、长寿性等指标将进一步提升，满足先进核能技术的发展需要。核燃料循环后段的科技将不断加强。绿色化、数字化、智能化技术将推进核能产业全线升级。核能发展关系到碳中和目标的实现。核能作为高科技产业，需要各国加强合作。当前
，新冠肺炎疫情影响广泛深远，世界经济复苏面临严重挑战，世界各国更加需要加强科技开放合作，通过科技创新，共同探索解决重要的全球问题和途径方法，共同应对时代挑战。各国和协会作为重要的创新平台，将在推动建立全球核能创新网络，营造一流创新生态中发挥自身优势，共同推进第四代反应堆、先进核燃料、干法后处理等基础关键技术的研究和科技成果转化，为促进核能。在应对气候变化和实现能源经济转型上做出更重要的贡献。谢谢大家。So I think we we can thank、uh, Mr. Van Chauvin for having sent this video,、um, <coughs> knowing the very difficult situation for traveling back and forth from China,、uh, and the very me vivid message he has given on the on the bioant industry over there. Uh, developing lots of concepts and giving a, I think, also a good message for all of us. Now、um, I will hand over to Diana Cameron,、uh, who's the first speaker.、Uh, she will、uh, give, from the NEA point of view, the insight and targets of role of nuclear energy、uh, and reactor technologies for various applications. Uh, Diane is currently the head of the Nuclear Technology Development and Economic Division at OECD Nuclear Energy Agency.、Um, in her role at the NEA, she leads an expert team of economists and scientists that supports energy policy and nuclear energy policy development among NEA member countries by advancing evidence-based, authoritative assessments and analysis. In the areas of nuclear economics financing and cost reductions, as well as nuclear technology innovation and the fuel cycle. Just giving back a little bit earlier, from 2014 to 2021, Dan was the director of the Nuclear Energy, Energy Division with the Government of Canada. So she has a long experience to share with us. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here today,、um, and these were、uh, truly inspiring and, and motivating、uh, video remarks、uh, that we've just seen.、Uh, so I'll try to、uh, uh, try to build on what's been、uh, what's been shared already. I'm joining you from、uh, the Nuclear Energy Agency. We represent 34 member countries. Um, mostly from、uh, from OECD countries,、uh, collectively、uh, account for about 80 percent of global installed nuclear capacity.、Um, the the context here that's already been been flagged and that everyone is is very aware of, of course, is、uh, situating nuclear energy and its fuel cycle within the broader contexts of climate change, ambitions for net zero, and 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 of late. A renewed, albeit not new,、uh, priority on security of energy supply.、Uh, let me start with just a few remarks on the net zero ambitions.、Uh, we recently, at the Nuclear Energy Agency, released、uh, a report uh, that uh, attempts to quantify the potential, but also the limitations, of nuclear energy within、uh, pathways to net zero.、Uh, we began by reviewing 90 pathways, 90 published pathways、uh, under the IPCC, so that's United Nations Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change.、Um, 90 pathways that project. Uh, possible ways that the world could get from where it is today to where it needs to be, which is net zero by 2050. And when we reviewed those 90 different pathways, some of them were more focused on hydrogen, others more focused on CCUS, and so on.、Um, we took note of the role of nuclear across the 90 pathways, and we observed that on average, nuclear must triple. Its global installed nuclear footprint around the world between now and 2050、um, for 
for reaching net zero by 2050. So let me just re re reiterate that triple. So up from around uh, 400 gigawatts of global installed nuclear capacity today to nearly 1,200 gigawatts of global installed nuclear capacity by 2050. And when we first did that calculation, our hearts sank a little uh, because that seems like a truly ambitious and um, daunting and maybe even uh, unachievable uh, objective at first glance. We then uh, took a step back and started uh, a bottom-up analysis. Uh, we put that, that calculation aside, uh, a little feeling a little bit demoralized, and we started instead to look at, well, what is the potential contribution from long-term operations of the existing fleet? What is the potential contribution from generation three new build projects that are either already under construction or at serious uh, stages of planning? Uh, what is the potential contribution from uh, SMRs, uh, near term and also medium term deployment between now and 2050? What is the potential contribution of SMRs and some generation, generation four technologies to break into heat markets and to start producing hydrogen for synthetic fuels? And when we did this bottom up sort of piece by piece analysis, we actually found that there are pathways um, whereby nuclear can actually nearly triple uh, in the next 30 years. Um, it is not beyond reach. However, the nuclear sector is not on track. Uh, the world is not on track to meet this objective. Uh, based on current plans and decisions and priorities, nuclear would be expected to, to grow uh, marginally from around 400 gigawatts of installed capacity to about just shy, uh, maybe 480 gigawatts of installed capacity by 2050 if current policies and decisions are not changed. But with the right policies, the right decisions, the right investments um, in LTO, uh, Generation 3, Generation 4, SMRs, Nuclear for Heat, Nuclear for Hydrogen, it could actually triple. Uh, this, this depends entirely on decisions that are yet to be made. And the key here is that these are very near-term, if not immediate decisions. Because of nuclear timelines, decisions taken now uh, will affect uh, the mix by 2050. So, so there's 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 an ambitious objective ahead of us. Uh, there's certainly um, challenges to overcome, uh, but it's doable. That said, there, there's an uncertainty in that range, right? That's a huge range between 480 gigawatts, uh, based on current plans, and 1,200 gigawatts of what we really should be striving for. Um, so what does this mean for the nuclear fuel cycle, folks? What does this mean for uranium and for fuel, uh, fuel production? Uh, what should you be aiming to do? What will the market actually look like? And, and those uncertainties um, are perhaps even further exacerbated by recent events in Ukraine and renewed uh, priority on security of energy supply. The, the war in Ukraine, uh, we don't know what the impact is going to be on demand for nuclear energy. Certainly, we can conclude that it will not have no impact and it will not uh, support status quo. There is, there is reason to believe that it, uh, it will cause renewed uh, demand and growth in demand and support for nuclear uh, nuclear development. Uh, but I think that there are still events that need to unfold uh, during that war, in particular that will test the international security, nuclear security frameworks. And, and there are scenarios that could unfold that would have opposite impact, that would reduce appetite or public support for nuclear. So there's, there's considerable uncertainty. Having said all of that, uh, there is reason for hope and there are signs of change uh, moving towards uh, renewed policies and renewed investments in nuclear. Uh, this was, as Mr. Chang, Mr. Wang excuse me, from uh, China recently noted, at COP26, the representation of nuclear in that dialogue was very uh, front and center. We've also seen recent announcements in France for six plus eight possibly additional EPRs, UK's announcements uh, to build 24 gigawatts of new nuclear capacity by 2050, Belgium, some, some announcements coming, un, some surprising announcements coming from jurisdictions, Belgium uh, extending LTO uh, long-term operations at two reactors and making, an, uh, making investments for the first time in nuclear R&D for SMRs, Korea reversing a phase-out policy, resuming construction, Netherlands announcing two new reactors, Canada down-selecting in Ontario and Saskatchewan uh, for SMR new builds that could be a fleet of, uh, of multiples 
fuels. Uh, Japan is continuing to restart its reactors. The U.S. is investing uh, massive amounts of money, $6 billion for long-term operations, and also massive amounts of, of investment and momentum in the U.S. for SMRs in Generation 4. Sweden, a very surprising announcement to begin studying SMRs. And this is not to mention China, Russia, India, the Middle East, and Africa. Uh, so there is um, uncertainty. Uh, the events in Ukraine uh, are still, the effects of the events in Ukraine are still to be seen. But, um, but there is also a, a big ambitious goal ahead of us uh, and reason for hope and reason for the nuclear sector to really be stepping up to play its role. I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Jan. Uh, so we will carry on uh, going around the world. I will give uh, the word to um, Mr. Arai from JAIF, uh, who will give us uh, a, an insight uh, on the global situation and perspectives of development of Japan. Uh, before uh, being appointed uh, president of JAIF, uh, Arai San served as director and deputy chief nuclear officer of TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company Holding, and he has a very long experience in the nuclear industry, more than 37 years at TEPCO. Aisa. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. I am Shiro Arai, uh, president of the Japan Atomic Industrial Forum. It's my great honor to have an opportunity today to talk about Japan's energy policy, nuclear power generation, and the nuclear fuel cycle, and join the panel discussion. At first, I would like to talk about Japan's energy policy. In 2021, Japan issued its sixth strategic energy plan, its policy on energy intended the first and the foremost to ensure stable supplies uh, permissed on securing safety. It also aims at realizing lower costs by enhancing efficiency. We refer to this as S plus three E's, safety plus energy security, economy, and environmental compatibility. Global instability and its effects on energy will remain a major concern. Japan's level of self-sufficiency in primary energy is low. Energy security requires that it be increased. At the same time, environmentally, as a means to combat climate change, Japan aims to realize carbon neutrality by 2050. Maximum use of decarbonized energy is vital. Nuclear power generation is positioned to contribute substantially in both areas. Next. Looking at the nuclear power generation in Japan, I would like to talk about three points. Firstly, restarting nuclear power plants. At present, there are 33 six plants are potentially operable in Japan, including those under construction. Only 10 have been restarted since the accident in 2011. One of those, Kansai Electric Power's Mihama Unit 3 last year became the first in Japan to be operated more than 40 years. Another seven units have been granted permission under the new regulatory standards to make changes to their install installations prior to restarting. And 10 more are being examined for that now. Realizing the three E's, the heart of national energy policy requires achieving a nuclear power share of 20 to 22 percent, targeted in the energy mix for fiscal year 2030. For that, plants will have to be restarted steadily and quickly. Secondly, research and development programs. In Japan, the government, research and development institutions, and private companies are focused together on nuclear technological innovation. A program called NEXIP was established, which includes budgetary means, co-use of R&D in structure, and uh, development of human resources in order to uh, support private companies in their efforts to develop innovative nuclear technology. 
Research and development are carried out on advanced light water reactors and possible future reactors to meet societal needs. Examples of those are next generation and small light water reactors, high temperature gas cooled reactors, fast reactors, and micro reactors. Expectations are high for Japanese companies' participation in overseas projects to develop, to develop advanced reactors. Thirdly, uh, promotion of the nuclear fuel cycle. Japan has made the nuclear fuel cycle its basic concept in the utilization of nuclear power. The nuclear fuel cycle is important from the viewpoint of effective use of natural resources, reducing volumes of high-level radioactive waste, and reducing toxicity. In order to continue its program of nuclear power generation, Japan will promote its fuel cycle activities while continuing to seek the understanding of concerned municipalities and the international community. Use of plutonium recovered through the reprocessing of spent fuel, its use in MOX fuel for further power generation is an important and effective use of resources. Four PWRs in Japan are currently burning MOX fuel. Japanese operators intended to do so at least 12 plants by fiscal year 2030. The Rokkasho Reprocessing Facility of Japan Nuclear Fuel Limited, together with its MOX fuel fabrication plant, will be core facilities in the MOX use program. Preparations are underway for their operation in cooperation with the French nuclear company Orano. The reprocessing plant will be able to process up to 800 tons of spent fuel per year and will be completed in the first half of fiscal year 2022. The MOX fuel fabrication plant will be completed in the first half of fiscal year 2024. It will produce up to 130 tons heavy metal of MOX fuel annually. Finally, I'd like to conclude my speech. Nuclear power generation offers supply stability, economic efficiency, and environmental compatibility. In coordination and cooperation with the international community, the Japanese nuclear industry will continue its activities to add maximum use of the nuclear power and the completion of the fuel cycle. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Arisa. So I will now hand over to Andrew Griffith uh, from the DOE, uh, who is going to talk to us about the advanced reactor program, including SMR and AMR implications for the fuel cycle, in particular supply of fresh fuel, including HALO, if I say it properly, uh, <coughs> and options for the back end of the fuel cycle. Uh, he's currently the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Nuclear Fuel Cycle and Supply Chain for the U.S. Department of Energy, of Nuclear Energy. And he, and he has over 35 years of experience working in the nuclear technology, including positions in the Navy uh, Nuclear Submarine Force, DOE's Office for Environmental Management and Office of Nuclear Energy. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, and it's good to be with you this morning. Uh, this is an incredibly important topic. And I, I think the, the, the context has been well established by the previous speakers, all of them, in fact. And, and I think we're, we're on the, the edge of a, a true moment uh, in nuclear energy. Um, and not just the advanced reactors and deployment of SMRs, but, but also the fuel cycle, because we know that those reactors don't stand on an island individually. Uh, they all need support, and the fuel cycle is, is so incredibly important to that, to their operation. So I'll, I'll, I'll reemphasize uh, the goals of the current administration. Uh, they've been pretty forward-leaning in this area, uh, decarbonizing the electric grid by 2035 and decarbonizing all energy sectors by 2050. Uh, clearly, nuclear is going to be a, a key part of that. Uh, it started 
uh, I think really the, the, the broad support for uh, and recognition of the role that nuclear will play in the energy future uh, started with the Energy Act of 2020 in the U.S., uh, which did support the establishment of uh, a commercial supply chain for the high assay LEU, um, and I'll get into that a little bit more. Uh, but also the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, also known as the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, uh, passed last year, uh, really recognized broadly that uh, we need to preserve the existing fleet while new renewable energy uh, sources are added to the grid. Uh, but also it forward funded the, uh, the demonstration reactors awarded under the Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, both the TerraPower Natrium Reactor as well as the X Energy XE100 reactor uh, over, over a, a five year period, $2.5 billion forward funding that, which, which did a, a long, uh, went a long way toward de risking the, the future outlook of that, uh, those uh, public private partnership uh, endeavors. It also uh, provided $8 billion for four hydrogen hubs, uh, one of which was required to be nuclear powered which I think is, is also a recognition of the uh, potentially huge role that nuclear will play in a hydrogen economy, as well as other industrial applications of the higher temperature generation four reactors. So with the more recent events, uh, the war in Ukraine and the uncertainty in the, uh, the markets for gas and, and oil, um, it really has, I think, put nuclear squarely uh, as a, a uh, potentially a, a sooner uh, resolution or solution for a net zero carbon future, uh, skipping over oil and gas per, perhaps, where a lot of countries were expecting gas to, to be that transition energy source. Uh, I, think, I think the acceleration of deployment of nuclear, as Deanne uh, pointed out, uh, is really, I think, uh, something that, that has yet to be seen, but the opportunity is there. And I think it is a partnership between governments and industry to achieve that, that future. So how do we stand up a, a high assay LEU supply chain um, in a market that doesn't exist yet because of the chicken and egg dynamic or static situation between uh, investment in advanced reactors that require this fuel source that doesn't exist yet commercially and a fuel source that has no customers currently. Uh, so I, I, think, I think there's going to be more discussion on that on the U.S. side. Um, clearly, uh, the administration is in discussion with uh, Congress on how to achieve that, how to establish that market. And it's important that it be established in a diverse and market-driven competitive manner so that it's not just one supplier because that's not a really long-term solution. And so establishing that in, in the correct way that recognizes, that, that establishes those market forces, I think is gonna be really important. Also with uh, the war in Ukraine causing some uncertainty on the LEU supply chain, uh, I think, again, uh, there's a role for government to help incentivize new capacity so that uh, there is more diversity and more competition. Um, how we do that um, is, is still yet to be seen, but uh, again, we're, we're discussing you know, how the U.S. government could take a role to move things in a, in a correct direction um, and hopefully uh, partner with our, our international partners as well. You know, clearly, uh, the, the uncertainty that, that exists today uh, it, it's put a, a pretty clear, uh, it's made a really clear point, I think, to everyone. Uh, we've, we've gained this through our bipartisan discussions as well as our multilateral discussions that energy security really is national security. And, and while some of us have been saying that for some time now, I think more and more people are recognizing that that's the truth. And so, you know, we, we can't waste this opportunity. We need to take advantage of it. We need to move forward. Um, I, I think regarding uh, a, a circular uh, fuel economy or recycling uh, spent nuclear fuel in the U.S., I think that's still a ways off. I think the deployment of advanced reactor technology opens the door wider. 
Um, I think the use of high assay LEU fuel where the recovered fissile material is more valuable, um, I think that helps the economics. Um, I think the regulatory framework exists to move forward with it. Um, I've got uh, a great deal of confidence in our Nuclear Regulatory Commission to oversee the safety and security of closing the nuclear fuel cycle in the U.S. Um, the economics are still uh, a challenge, I would say, but uh, I think with the deployment of advanced reactors, as I said, uh, opens the opportunity where, where we could see movement in that area, and, and we'll just have to see. Um, and clearly, as stated earlier, um, that, that recycling the fuel better use, utilizes that fissile material, um, reduces the burden on a future repository, um, which I'm glad to say we have resumed the, the consent-based siting process to help identify communities that are willing to host uh, interim storage facilities initially and then uh, pave the way for a long-term disposition solution to the U.S. in the long term. Um, and so we'll just have to see, but uh, I, I think we're on a very good path now. Uh, I look forward to the, the uh, discussion with the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> so I will now give the word to Rob Arnold from uh, BIS, United Kingdom, uh, who's going to talk to us about new energy plan and nuclear power development and dedicated R&D program. Uh, Rob is currently the Principal Technical Advisor on Net Zero Energy Innovation, uh, Department of Business Energy and uh, Industrial Surgery for the United Kingdom. Uh, he's currently working on delivering the UK's program in nuclear R&D and technology innovation. Projects seek to develop the next generation of nuclear power reactors and the advanced fuel cycle. Uh, approaches that are necessary to support these in a safe and a sustainable manner. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And it's hugely encouraging to see the um, uh, first post, well, first meeting of the global conference since the pandemic taking place. Uh, it, it's a pleasure to uh, speak to you on a number of issues. I, I think being the part way down the speaking list, you're going to notice that you're looking at six people in furious agreement on quite a lot of issues here. So I'll try not to repeat what my, uh, my colleagues have, uh, have said here. Um, I would note though, um, when Diane talks about uh, the uh, energy system modeling, um, back before um, uh, uh, any of the issues of the energy crisis or the war in Ukraine uh, or even small and advanced modular reactors, the UK was looking at uh, trajectories and technology pathways to net zero and in many or almost all of all the cases of, of the lowest cost transition pathways, nuclear played a uh, substantial role. So the assumption by the UK uh, uh, that, that nuclear was going to be part of the future energy mix has been there for some time. But um, uh, that's not just for electricity, of course, um, especially in, in countries such as the UK and, and, and France and many of the ones represented here. You're in a temperate climate, you're requiring uh, uh, heat, both low grade for space heating, you're, you've got industrialized economies, you're looking for heat for industrial processes. And, uh, and so heat is a very substantial part of the energy economy uh, that we're hoping that nuclear will be able to address. Um, so that, that, that's not just sort of um, space heating and water heating and uh, uh, things you can, couple into existing uh, power stations uh, from just as you can from, from any thermal plant. Uh, you're also looking at the potential for uh, nuclear to drive um, uh, processes such as uh, carbon capture and storage, which requires heat and requires quite a lot of heat that may not be high temperature, but is in high volume. And the question is, how are you going to source that in a low carbon manner? If you're looking at industry, then you're looking at higher grades of heat. You're looking at the types of heat that would be able to support industrial processes, uh, the production of low carbon hydrogen, uh, low carbon chemical industry, uh, and also possibly uh, underpin a synthetic fuels production supply chain. So you have to have the reactors to deliver these technical capabilities. The reactors that can deliver the siting, the flexibility, uh, and, and, and perform with the right kind of economics, 
uh, that will allow them to be attract attractive business propositions. Um, the UK ha has not been alone in uh, in analysing uh, this. It's it's it had a series of programmes to first look at the technology and economics of light water SMRs, and more recently to develop. Uh, ways of developing um, uh, uh, the, the regulatory capability, the technology knowledge to underpin a, a series of advanced non-light water reactor systems. Um, uh, this is really with the expectation that you're going to deliver to a much wider and diverse range of applications in the near future. Um, uh, I mean, the uh, uh, ability um, uh, to achieve a net zero carbon transition by 2050 is going to require an, a, an element of this. So some of the developments recently in energy strategy have been the commitments to develop a, a small modular reactor design by 2030 and to construct a, 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 a non-light non water cooled uh, design, what we term to be an advanced modular reactor uh, in the 2030s to make a decision on the next construction of a, a, a large light water power station, uh, and even, in fact, to push forward our fusion demonstration program to power production by 2040. But uh, all, the, all the fission technologies there uh, require a fuel cycle technology that will support that. So uh, we're looking at the, providing the safety, the security, and the sustainability to win public approval for it and to be able to do that at an affordable cost given the energy crisis. Uh, that requires it to be able to support a whole range of new capabilities, uh, including possibly remote decommissioning for small modular systems and the appropriate safety um, uh, and, and security approaches for deploying reactors on uh, a, a wider range of sites. Um, it also has to be able to, to cope with um, uh, the, uh, all, the, all the, the safety and security aspects of, of being able to manage them on different sites to uh, what you would normally find with a large power station. Uh, we've been uh, putting a lot of effort into developing the fuel cycle to support this. Um, uh, our particular areas of interest include uh, high density fuels and new materials such as uranium nitride for safer light water systems, uh, new claddings um, and coatings for those fuels, and the development of high temperature reactor fuels, um, uh, uh, including uh, better fuel quality in manufacture and uh, coatings. Uh, we're also putting a lot of efforts into uh, advanced processing uh, in, in order to um, both um, uh, uh, to, to, to deliver the requir requirements to for the safety and security of, of disposal and, um, uh, and closing as many materials cycles as we can. Uh, I think as a final point, uh, it, it would be... Um, uh, remiss of me not to mention the additional value that's beginning to be extracted from the fuel cycle, especially when you have a mature fuel cycle um, uh, uh, in which you've had fuel stored for a number of decades. Um, the fuel cycle processing capabilities uh, that you'll hear discussed at this, content, uh, th this conference include uh, issues such as the ability to develop small decay-based power sources um, uh, things like radio isotope generation technologies uh, that are becoming uh, uh, more possible um, uh, due to the availability of materials uh, from the fuel cycle uh, over many decades and the developments of um, extraction processes to access those materials. You also have the opportunities to develop um, medical and industrial radionuclides. Um, again, off the back of the processing technologies for the fuel cycle and uh, the uh, uh, evolution of materials in uh, spent fuel stockpiles over the decades. And these should not be downplayed. Um, uh, the ability to create new medical therapeutics and theragnostic um, uh, um, uh, 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 pharmac radiopharmaceuticals uh, could be of great benefit to society and I think is one of those areas that um, uh, is not often appreciated by um, uh, a wider public audience. 
So to wrap things up, I'm very delighted to see you all together today. I wish you a, uh, a highly productive meeting and I look forward to hearing about all the innovation and development that is going to be discussed here. Thank you, Rob. Um, I will now hand over to Michael Hubel from the European Commission, who's going to talk to us about the European SMR and AMR projects, MIMOSA project, and the European Sovereignty on Nuclear Energy. Um, Michael uh, joined the General Directorate of Energy uh, in January 2017. Uh, he's currently head of unit uh, for radiation protection and nuclear safety with the responsibility for relevant Eurotom legislation, uh, monitoring radioactivity in the environment, emergency preparedness and response, as well as the Samurai Initiative on medical applications and health protection. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and really for the invitation to this event. It's great to have these in-person events again and uh, we're also looking forward, I'm looking forward to the discussions, to the uh, technical uh, talks we'll be hearing over the day. So it should be a very interesting day. So thanks for that. It's getting increasingly difficult as we move around the panel, really. Uh, but um, I think from the Commission's perspective, when we look at the situation in nuclear, and certainly with my safety hat on, uh, I think we cannot start, I cannot start such an intervention without again coming back to the war in Ukraine and the change that has brought to our perception of, uh, you know, not only geopolitically, but also our, per our perception of security, energy security, picking up what Andrew said, and, uh, and really nuclear safety in the world and the way that not only that war was waging, that nu but also the, how nuclear facilities were targeted during that war and are being targeted in this war, raise very serious safety and uh, security concerns. Um, we are working very closely with international partners uh, to support Ukraine in this regard. We are working very closely on safety issues. We're working very closely uh, really also with the international agency in terms of having access to facilities. And I think in any Congress, even if it is not the sort of direct focus of the discussions here, this is a backdrop of uh, political attention, uh, which we will have to take into, we will have to take into account. But of course, the situation of the war in Ukraine has really put the security of supply questions back in the middle of the, of the discussions and, uh, uh, it, is, it is clear that energy markets have been massively disrupted. The European Union has uh, invested massively in trying to uh, deal with the dependency on Russian energy imports in different forms. Uh, but we need to be aware, of course, that this also has a nuclear component, as again, I think Andrew was talking about. Uh, we, we have uh, five of our nuclear member states who are depending are directly on the supply of Russian nuclear fuel. Uh, and uh, we have broader concerns about nuclear material in terms of uranium fuel and services, in terms of enrichment and conversion from Russia. So these are things which are very much on our mind, very much on the mind of our member states uh, and uh, issues we're working on very closely with partners really across commission departments and policy fields, but also uh, with partners in the regulatory authorities, with operators, with the industry. And I think this is something which will be very, very important to address. And it, of course, it goes beyond the nuclear power field. And uh, uh, Rob has talked about medical applications in terms of future opportunities. Uh, we could also talk about medical applications in terms of concerns of supply chains uh, in the short term. And both discussions, of course, can and should be linked. And it'll be important to sort of look at innovation in those, in those areas. 
If this conference would have taken a year ago, we would have started, of course, with decarbonization and the role of nuclear. And of course, we also are committed to the commitments under the Paris Agreement, climate neutrality, uh, emissions reductions, and so on. And with the European Green Deal, there's a very strong framework for that uh, in place. Um, we, of course, have to face the reality in the European Union that member states take different choices in terms of their energy mixes. But it has already been said, and I think Diana had a long list there, including of EU member states, uh, that there is a bit of rethinking going on, both in terms of developing uh, the nuclear uh, landscape in terms of countries who already are nuclear countries in the EU, and even sort of countries who are considering uh, joining the sort of nuclear countries in terms of big reactors, in terms of small modular reactors, other technologies, and so on. And it's very clear that in the overall picture that gives for the European Union, nuclear power plays a very, very important role in that energy mix uh, to complement renewables to achieve the, uh, the climate, climate targets. And taxonomy, which will be where the Delegated Act will be voted upon in the Parliament uh, during our lunch break, I understand, uh, will, is an important building block in that, certainly in terms of the European Commission's proposal. And we will see what European lawmakers make of it. Um, but of course, that's just one building block in that, in that overall, in that overall uh, story. Our concern, and again putting the safety hat on, is nuclear safety not just because it is important, obviously, uh, and it's enshrined in our legislation, but it's also an important legitimizing factor. And I think uh, Rob also pointed out that it's an important point also in terms of the public credibility of the nuclear industry that we do, uh, that there is a common understanding of the need for this high level of nuclear safety. We've just published a report, which you may have seen, on the implementation of the nuclear safety framework within the European Union, which does paint a, fair, a very positive picture of the achievements in member states uh, since the new legal framework came into place after the uh, Fukushima accident. Um, but it also shows that there is some diversity. And I think one of the strengths of the European Union in this field, as in others, is that we can help member states work with each other to sort of work towards uh, what would be considered to be good practice in countries, both in terms of governance and regulatory practice, but also in terms of very practical issues around the, uh, the nuclear safety objectives and other principles in this in this field. And of course, there is an equally strong framework, which I think is helpful for similar reasons in terms of waste and uh, long-term disposal. Now, our chairman asked me to say a few words about the sort of future technologies. And of course, it's important here to see that the research investment, you may say it's limited, but I think it's very targeted in terms of um, both uh, investing into the safety uh, of the existing technologies, but also investing into future technologies. And Mimosa is a good example of where I think we have put money onto a promising technology for the future. It's just started, so we will see how it develops. But I mean, it's an interesting project. All in all, there's been an investment from the EU budget of around 100 million euros in the last <clears throat> funding cycle into the Euratom Research and Innovation Program. Um, and there will be more to come as the program uh, develops further. In terms of SMRs, mentioned by all the speakers, important new technologies, but many technologies actually, which are being developed. So uh, uh, this poses uh, challenges, particularly also on the regulatory side. So we have facilitated the cooperation of member states, industrial actors, regulators, uh, utilities, research, and financial institutions into what will hopefully become a very viable European SMR partnership with an international dimension as well of cooperation. So that is an important uh, really factor in terms of uh, promoting where member states are interested, promoting uh, a quick deployment of the SMR uh, technologies. And it's obvious that Again, it has been said, there are spin-offs, there are other applications, the link to 
district heating and he, the importance of heat is also here on my little speaking notes, but Rob took it from me, but it's true, it's an important issue. And also, of course, hydrogen and hydrogen generation as a second important area where we would uh, be seeing uh, where would be seeing potential. And of course, being in France, I need to mention that it's important to also talk about fusion here as a long-term perspective uh, in terms of the ITER project and other projects in this field. So it's a big, it's a big area and uh, it's an area where there are large European interests and challenges and potentials. So it's very challenging times. I think uh, the jury is still out to see what this combination of many uh, challenges, in particular the war, will really mean for the future of the, uh, of the nuclear industry, certainly in the short and medium term. We will have to see, and I think Diana pointed that out as well. But of course, there are many opportunities arising out of that as well. And uh, it will be important to build those opportunities on innovation, on, uh, on uh, technological development. And in that sense, I think this Congress is, is very important. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And now to finish, I will uh, <coughs> give the floor to Sophie Mourlon who is currently the Director for Energy at the Energy Transition Ministry, uh, who's give us, uh, who shall give us a global overview on the French uh, future of uh, the nuclear industry. Uh, Sophie brings in a unique experience of having worked several times both uh, in the French Nuclear Safety Authority as an independent body and at the same time uh, alternating uh, various positions in the French administration. So it's a quite unique position and a good observation point. Sophie. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, uh, for this introduction and uh, well, for all that has been said and I think that paves the way for the different issues. As you said, I, um, as being the French representative, uh, French administration representative here, um, I can give you an overview of uh, the, our energy policy and uh, the future that we're shaping um, with the, all the different challenges that have been mentioned. Our energy policy, as any country, has of course three pillars and three objectives which are all challenged right now due to the current situation. The objective for climate neutrality, the security of supply, and the cost. Um, I won't cover deeply the questions of uh, climate urgency. I think this has been uh, quite detailed by the previous speakers, and I suppose that we all share in the room the, the concern, uh, the Paris Agreement, the European objectives which are being raised, the Green Deal, and this objective of net zero by 2050, which is a real challenge, but which is also a real uh, emergency. Security of supply, uh, we're living very challenging times. It was already, as you said, if we had spoken one year ago, uh, we would have say how challenging security of supply is through the transition. This stays. But on top of that, uh, the war in Ukraine reminds us uh, of the weight of dependencies and of uh, what is at stake uh, with security of supply in the choices of our energy policies and our energy mixes. Um, so that we are, I think that in the energy world, we're all conscious of that, but it brings back this issue very strongly and it uh, re, re questions our options and our choices for the energy mix. Then third, all that has to be done at a reasonable price. We also live that very strongly, especially in Europe, but all over the world, uh, with the different crises that have been going on for the past years. The COVID crisis, the recovery after the COVID with the rise of the prices, now the war, which puts all the prices up very high. And uh, in, in Europe, uh, on top of that, the disruption of, of the electricity market. So we have an issue for the households, more globally for the economy, for all the consumers. Uh, as was said, energy is at the heart of the economy, it's at the heart of daily lives. So it's uh, also a third issue in our energy policy that is very important together with the other ones. 
In France, we have been uh, preparing decisions on our long-term energy mix to 2050 for, uh, for some time. Uh, we have published uh, in the past months a number of very important studies. One that was done by our um, uh, electricity uh, transport, support transport system organization. It's called Energy Future 2050. It's also published in English for those of you who don't know it and would like to refer to it. It has studied various scenarios of electricity mix to 2050 uh, with different scenarios of um, uh, electricity demand within the global energy uh, demand, all that in an interconnected European market. It has studied different scenarios, uh, some with, uh, with different shares of nuclear, with different shares of um, renewables, different kinds of renewables, studying their economic impact and also their environmental footprint. Uh, we also published this winter a study on the challenges for a new nuclear program in France uh, with the industrial challenges, with an um, in-depth review of the issues for waste management, for fuel cycle management. This has been published this winter. And with that, our President of the Republic this winter State paved the way for the decisions of our uh, energy mix for the next years. First, the first pillar, I think, was mentioned. It's very important to mention it again. First is uh, economies of energy, energy efficiency. Uh, we won't reach our goals without really reducing our dependency on energy as a whole. Uh, even including the need for decarbonization, for hydrogen, for we need to uh, lower our, our uh, um, consumption. And in France, our objective is more or less to divide by two. Divide by two by 2050, our net global energy consumption, which is an incredible challenge. I think that everyone measures that. In that, we'll have to develop electricity. Uh, the, probably the, will, the electricity demand will rise by 35%. We have different scenarios, of course, depending on the, the evolution of industry, of uh, uh, the demand for hydrogen, but more or less, plus 35% uh, of electricity. By renewing globally our uh, electricity system in France, because most of our electricity system, the nuclear fleet, but also all the renewable um, fleet, even the grid, uh, have all been built uh, roughly in the same period in the 70s, 80s, early 90s. All that has to be renewed by 2050. And it's not a, a political statement, it's a technical uh, reality that we have to face. To face that, we'll have to develop all our decarbonized uh, electricity sources, renewables and nuclear. Um, so, our uh, president announced that we would launch a program of six new uh, nuclear power plants, six EPRs, to be built and come into operation for the first one in the around 2035-2037 and study eight more. Um, of course, this uh, energy policy will be uh, revised uh, before 2050, but this paves the way for the development of a new nuclear program. He also um, stated again the importance of uh, studying and uh, paving the way for SMRs and developing SMRs and the importance of innovation. To do that, we're facing a number of challenges. Industrial challenges first. Uh, we have not been building uh, nuclear power plants for, except for the um, uh, Flamanville 3, uh, uh, which is a uh, close to completion, uh, but a, a massive industrial program. We have not done that since the 90s in France. So it's a real industrial challenge to put all the industry ready to face the challenge, to deliver uh, the building of these plants in due time uh, and uh, in costs also, which is uh, important. So the industry is on it. I'm sure you'll discuss that uh, through the, these days of, of work, but it's of course a big challenge. 
a financial challenge that I think all countries in the world are facing and uh, we're facing it in Europe. Uh, the development, this energy transition, the development of new fleets uh, is also a financial challenge that we have to overcome together and we're expecting much for the, from the European Commission to help us on that. Um, the impacts on waste management have been studied uh, and of course the development of the geological repository and all um, the um, industry for uh, waste management is, uh, is important and will be part of the program. And also the strategy for the fuel cycle, uh, which will have to be updated. We have a clear way until 2040. To go beyond 2040, we'll have to make extensive studies on uh, the per perspectives of our uh, fuel cycle, fuel reprocessing plants in particular, depending on the choices uh, made beyond that uh, period on our um, uh, nuclear fleet. So that gives us work for some time now uh, to get all of that going uh, all the way to 2050. On top of it, the importance of uh, research and development of, and innovation has been stressed again. This has been tackled already. We're part of the SMR initiative and uh, our industry is already working on uh, concepts of SMRs. Um, the, through an investment plan to 2030, France will put um, to start half a billion euros for the development of uh, this new concept of SMR. Uh, so it's a very ambitious plan uh, that we'll be working on. There's also an issue, I'm sure it will be discussed, on skills. Uh, it has been tackled by um, Mr. Grossi to start with, and it's, a, it's another challenge that we have to face. It's linked, of course, with the industrial challenges, but uh, we'll also be putting some, um, some money, some subsidies from our investment plan on this issue of the development of, of skills and uh, the workforce at all levels, I mean, for, for the, the, the whole program. With that, I think I, I, I covered mostly uh, all the, the incredible ambition of this transition. And uh, I think we're facing it in all the countries in the world, but really touching the issue of reaching net zero by changing all of our energy system is an incredible challenge. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. Um, now it's due time for questions, but uh, I think we are running out of time. So um, I had prepared questions for any one of you. Uh, I won't have the time to run through all of them. So I, I would just raise one question. Perhaps you would not be willing to answer directly, but I'd like to be a little bit itchy. Um, as an industry representative, uh, future appears to be promising, but uh, financial constraints is there. Uh, and as any industrial, uh, to make a proper investment decision, we need to have some kind of certainty for the future. And all of you have described a balance between let's invest in the current techniques that we do master quite well let's also pave the way for future types of reactors that will, and here at Global, will need different type of fuels. And those type of fuels will need different types of facilities. So how do you envision the, cap the industry capacity to answer new needs for those fuels, the current ones and the future ones, and the ability to deliver it fast and efficiently if some of those facilities do not exist yet. I, I can uh, get us started on a response to that. Uh, I, as an international organization, I'm not speaking for any individual government, so it may be a little bit easier for me to answer and to, to say that um, I think it was uh, Andy mentioned the chicken and egg challenge with fuel cycle versus reactors. Um, who moves first? Investors uh, in new reactors or investors in the fuel cycle to support those? And um, I think that one thing is clear, uh, that a decision not to invest uh, in the fuel cycle would guarantee 
uh, that would certainly provide certainty. It would guarantee uh, that the nuclear sector will not grow to meet the target of tripling by 2050, uh, uh, which we know it needs to do. Uh, another thing is clear, uh, which is that uh, governments have a role to play uh, in establishing the infrastructure and partnering with industry um, in sharing risks and in setting clear policies uh, for the development of the fuel cycles that are necessary. Um, I think we see more clearly now, perhaps than at any time, at least in, uh, in my lifetime, that energy infrastructure is critical infrastructure. Energy security is national security. Uh, and so uh, as a member of an international organization, uh, certainly our advice to our member states is that there is a role for government in this space. Yeah, I'll go. Um, I couldn't agree more. Uh, I, I think you, you got it just right. And I think the, the, the question really captures the, the situation with high assay LEU uh, quite, quite uh, concisely uh, because we know we have to act now. Um, doing it efficiently, quickly and efficiently, you know, that has yet to be seen. But it all starts with investment now. And so that's part of the discussion that we're having with our Congress on how can we fund activities that incentivize quickly and efficiently the establishment of a commercial supply chain that doesn't exist now. And, it, and it's so incredibly important. Um, talking to your point about the, the advanced reactors that are being deployed or envisioned to be deployed in the coming decades, um, they will need new fuels. And so part of our efforts are also focused on how can we, how can we um, help and we're working with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and members of industry on how we can accelerate new fuel qualification because the old way of cook and look um, is just takes too long. We, now we have high performance computing. Uh, we have advanced post radiation examination techniques and, and also an emerging uh, field is, is uh, in situ instrumentation so we can record data real time that will help our, our high performance computing models to become even more predictive than they are today. So I think the promise is, is great there. Um, you know, we can't afford to take 20 years to qualify fuel. We have to bring that time down significantly, I think. Um, and, it's, and it's also the importance of getting started with the deployment of the advanced technology and its supporting fuel cycle, cycle infrastructure and technologies because we know it's just a starting point and that you know, given what we've learned from the evolution and improvement of the light water reactor technology, uh, the same applies to the advanced reactor technologies that will be deployed in the coming years because over the next several decades, we know they will evolve and improve. And, and that's why it's so important that we don't neglect the investment of the R&D um, area as well. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. Uh, and you've answered another question I had prepared. How do we prepare the safety authorities to potentially agree to new developments and new techniques that they do not currently know? I know yeah, some. They have to be part of the conversation. Definitely. Yes, maybe, maybe I can also um, answer on that. I think that uh, giving the, the view uh, to our different safety authorities on what we're working on for energy policies is obviously very important. I, I, I'm sure that all countries uh, which are um, looking at uh, perspectives for their energy policies are doing that. We also have to support which, what exists today, which is a good community between the uh, nuclear safety authorities worldwide uh, for them to work together. And for that, I think that the NEA of the OECD as well as uh, the IAEA, they have good um, technical communities and uh, strong uh, working groups on that also under the European Commission. So, and, and the, obviously for the future, what we would want and expect is for the nuclear safety authorities to work even closer for the future uh, assessment and uh, permitting of new uh, concepts and new fuels uh, to be in a state which would be a bit different from today, that uh, we get is easier permitting uh, over the world for a given concept, uh, with the different nuclear safety authorities looking at the nuclear uh, at the safety options and the safety concepts together uh, from from the start uh, and develop concepts that are compatible with different legislations in different countries. 
Well, let me just briefly say to, uh, that I agree. It's uh, cooperation of safety authorities is incredibly important. I mean, we have, uh, as you're saying, a framework in place globally, but also at European level. And this is relevant not just for new technologies. This is equally relevant for countries who might decide to become nuclear, to help a new safety authority to come up to speed, to understand um, the intricacies in licensing and regulatory oversight. And I think it is very, very important, and there is a perspective even to strengthen that, that support. And it's equally important in discussions like we have on the short-term discussions on security of supply, that not just operators and utilities work together, but also safety authorities, uh, regulatory authorities work together so that there is a good coordination and uh, uh, there, 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 is, um, there is sort of an understanding of needs, requirements, and also of urgencies of some of the developments. So that's indeed an important issue. R&D equally, I mentioned the program at EU level which is small, but I think if it is well targeted, it can make a big difference. And also this convening power of bringing partners together. I mean, I've mentioned the SMR partnership. I could also mention the European Radioisotope Observatory to go into a completely different area. There are a number of these initiatives where I think also um, uh, a lot of added value is there and can be further developed in terms of cooperation in the EU context. Thanks, yes. Um, I, I think it's worth commenting um, on uh, uh, the UK's experience when it was undertaking its early analysis of smaller systems that we had a very different approach between the, the established light water technologies uh, and the requests from developers there and the development requests from uh, those are sort of what we call advanced modular reactor systems, uh, which are generally generation four designs. Um, uh, and uh, the, the light water developers were very much more interested in uh, uh, the, the, the ability to, to, to cite and understand the economics of, uh, of energy supply, uh, things like the contracts of difference, the, the ability to invest in the construction, uh, and the non-light water um, uh, part of the, uh, the development market was very much more interested in uh, the, the ability to access uh, public research funds, engage with um, regulators on uh, on how to uh, address the new designs, and that is largely underpins the two-track approach that the UK has taken on supporting nuclear innovation um, over the last five to seven years, really. Um, so, I mean, being in an environment where most of these designs are being presented as um, uh, global initiatives, regulatory alignment is very uh, I important, uh, but, but also actually regulatory support to upskill and to be able to cope with uh, emerging designs, uh, particularly in the non-light water sector is, is, is a key enabler, I think. Um, likewise, the ability to build up a lot of uh, digital um, uh, 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 technology to uh, twin and simulate and accelerate the um, uh, permitting of that. Uh, I think um, generally though um, uh, we also sort of uh, recognize that the new fuel forms uh, particularly for things like coated particle fuel are going to be very different um, and whilst there was activity on that in the past. Um, uh, uh, we've run our own high temperature reactor uh, uh, for a while in, in the past. And in fact, most of our, whilst most of our fleet are gas cooled reactors operating at a high temperature, the fuel form is still oxide pellets and not coated particle fuels. So I think the supply chain for that is, is something that we are paying a uh, considerable amount of attention to. Thank you, Rob. Conscious time is over. Uh, I would like to thank all our panel members uh, who really testify of what they are contributing to or trying to put in place in various countries or organizations. Thank you again.